All right, so we're recording. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Johnny Nomad Presents. And today we present a life coach, Lena. <laughs> um, I found Lena on Instagram and I was kind of following her for a little while and I saw her inspiration and and just this kind of powerful woman um, coming through this IG account. And I has had to DM her and uh, get her on. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> You are gracious enough to, to to come on to the podcast. So thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Johnny, for taking the time to interview someone with only eight hundred followers, not oh. thousands of followers. Thank you for checking out the uh, the profile and for the great introduction. So I thank you very much for that, for your time, for your purpose, for everything. Thank you. No, absolutely, because I think honestly, like you know, I, I'm not looking for the big folks. I'm looking for the real people that's putting it in, you know, that's going to yeah. do it organically and just going to take their time doing it right. You know, um, just because you have a hundred thousand followers doesn't mean they're active followers, right? Exactly. Exactly. 100%. You know, so, um, why don't you give people a little background about yourself, where you're at, you know, what you do. All right. Perfect. So, uh, how old do you want the background to be? Oh, let's start from the beginning. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So from the beginning, uh, I'm Egyptian. I live in Kuwait with my family. Um, I studied economics um, at the American University in Kuwait. And then after graduation, I worked there for three years and a half as an admissions counselor, where this um, particular time helped me the most to shape my purpose and actually understand what I truly want in life and to shape my purpose and get to know it, which is changing the world one person at a time. And um, to understand that I'm truly not a perfectionist, I'm a passionate. So the minute I lose my passion for something is the minute it's ending no matter what. And that's what happened. The moment I lost my passion for my job, where I, I need a newer challenge, was the moment that I decided that I had to quit and uh, pursue a new career that I was very passionate about, which served my purpose 1000%, which is becoming a life coach. That's amazing. So how was it um, growing up in Egypt? Did you grow up in Egypt or did you, did you grow up in Kuwait? No, I didn't. I was born in Egypt and I came up, I came here in Kuwait when I was three years or three and a half, something like that. Gotcha. So how was that growing up in Kuwait? Uh, actually, it's great because you can easily um, stand out. Um, I was very lucky that my father is my father. Because if it wasn't for my father, no one would have pushed me to become the strong woman that I am today right. and uh, to be as inspirational as I tried to be and an advocate for empowering people. So growing up in Kuwait was actually very um, challenging in some areas where, um, you know, you get to suffer from glass ceiling and the fact that they would think that a man can do stuff that a woman cannot do. So I suffered from that, but I never... Um, dealt with it as if it's something that I have to accept. It was never acceptable to me. I always knew that I can change it and that this situation, whether in Kuwait or outside of Kuwait, will only stay if I allow it to, to keep on going, which I will not allow. Um, the culture here is great. I love how the culture respects women. I love how the culture um, treats women with grace, regardless of the cultural um, suppression that might take place in the Middle East in general or worldwide in general. Right. Uh, the woman is actually treated like um, a jewel here in this part of the world, which I really love. And that's kind of um, that's really different compared to the other Middle Eastern st uh, states, correct? Like where uh, women are kind of held back and and they're not really given the opportunity as Kuwaitis are, correct? No, actually. Women are treated the same in the entire Middle East. They're not given the opportunity with the same degree. However, gotcha. there are some strong women who do not accept such, um, such treatment and they don't accept to be suppressed through glass ceiling and they fight their way, such as Lubna Al-Alayan, for example, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, She's like right. a greatest icon of her time. Yeah, that's amazing. And you talked about losing passion. And as you lost your passion for your job and you went into life coaching, was this something mm. that you always gave people advice on before you decided to be a life coach or 
or is this something that was just totally different for you to where you said, you know what, it just kind of hit you in the head. Wow, I should be a life coach. Actually, while I was still an admissions counselor, I, I thought of becoming a life coach. And then I started asking people who have a similar background, people who are already doing life coaching. Um, but I wasn't sure until it suddenly hit me when I completely, completely lost my passion for my job. That's when it hit me. Yes, I want to become a life coach because life coaching is such a classy thing to do because you basically don't tell people what to do. You empower them. You advocate that they have the answer within and that they should trust no one but themselves in order to get that answer out. You just listen to your own voice and that's your power. Um, the, the best answer is from within because it's based on your experience. It's based on uh, your life situations. It's all about you. So it's a great way of empowerment. And that's why I'm very passionate about it. No, that's amazing. I think you're absolutely right about that. I think it's a matter about kind of uh, having that person just really exude what they already have and teaching them how to come out of their own shell. Um, exactly. And then just letting them know that they actually have the power, that they can do it. They definitely do. I mean, advising someone on what to do is very easy, but it's actually very ineffective because my advice is based on my experience, not their situation. No, right. That's absolutely right. I think that's, that's, a, that's a gold gem right there. That's a gem of information right there. And I think, <laughs> I think people confuse a lot of things with um, whether it, there's motivational books, inspirational speakers, um, and they tend to live vicariously through that, even though life coaches, for that matter of fact, as well. And I guess, what do you tell someone who has low self-esteem about themselves? Low self-esteem? Yeah. Uh. See, I can tell them a lot of things, but are they actually going to listen? The best way is to ask them a series of questions and to tackle the problem from within. Why do they have low self-esteem? Because I can easily tell them, you are the best. No one is like you. You are something that's humongous in this world. You are of great value. You can literally change the world by starting with yourself. But is it actually effective? Like I can give them that great motivational energy for that, but it's not going to last for more than five minutes until the conversation is over or until I disappear, you know? No, absolutely. I but, think um, you're right about that. I think a lot of people are missing the drive behind the motivation. After the motivation is gone, what is driving you exactly. to continue? Exactly. So if I meet someone with low self, I actually got a lot of uh, clients with low self-esteem or low self-confidence, and we actually work together. And through coaching, I see amazing results, amazing results. Because it's all from within. Their self-esteem strengthens uh, through their ability to find out and to listen to themselves that the answer is actually within. I'm not telling them the answer at all. No, you're right. Do you think that life coaching is a new form of therapy? Uh, No. Uh, actually, um, therapy is different than counseling, different than coaching. Each one of is def- different than mentors than mentorship. Each one of them is a completely different hat. So no, it's not the same, because some um, some clients that I do receive are uncoachable because they would need therapy or they would need counseling. Got you. Wow, so so some people are uncoachable, and that makes that makes a lot of sense though, as far as the separation between uh, therapy and coaching. Um, yes. I think a lot of people confuse that. That's why I asked that question to make sure you have some clarity on that. And do you do you feel at any given time that when you're working with someone, that when they are not just getting it, how does that conversation happen? When you say, "Hey, you're not following the tools, not following, you know, um, the guide I'm trying to give you." Mm -hmm. What does that conversation look like? All right. So there's... um, All right. So I just want to highlight a a difference between therapy and coaching, first of all, that in coaching, the agenda is 100% set by the client. I only control 10% of the whole thing by asking certain questions based on the answers that I receive. But therapy... Um, I would say 80 to 90% of the agenda is being led by the therapist. And basically, they advise them, they specify what sort of order disorder do they have, they can uh, prescribe something, it's, it's different. It's, it's um, 
a tool to direct and to guide your patient or the person that's that needs therapy but in coaching it's the complete opposite so to answer your question a conversation can look like 40 minutes of coaching on a specific goal that they had and they're just not getting there and it's absolutely fine but what keeps me going is number one my trust that the client has the answer the answer is 100 percent within he just needs a coach with a torch to to highlight that issue and the second thing is a rule actually two rules that we learned in coaching number one is not everyone who wanders is lost. So we can keep on going and going and going for like 40, 45 minutes. And we both don't see a result, but I know that we are going in the right route. And second thing is the first issue is rarely the main issue. And that's where myself as a coach, I have to be very patient and I have to transfer this patience to the coachee or to the client. Because um, I know that they will get there. I know that they will get there. Now, to add to, to add to my answer, sometimes I would coach someone and we would agree on an action that they should take because an action is he, action here is the tool. So we both agree on an action that he tailored for himself based on his own circumstances and situation. And then they wouldn't do the action, for example. Mm. There's another rule that comes. As a coach, I cannot save my, my, uh, my client's life. I'm not Spider-Man. And <laughs> we learned that as well. Yeah, because not every coach is, not every coach she or client is very self-aware and is willing to actually take the action and go through and carve his way through life by coaching. Some people just want it the easy way. And if you're like that, we're going to work together. I'll try my best to help you get there. But if you don't want to get there, then no one will get you there. Wow, that's as profound. You're, you're really right about that. And, you know, I, I think the stresses of life, I think, has made life, you know, life coaches really come to a prominent place nowadays. And and, and people wanting that extra, I guess, that the extra oomph to themselves or, or wanting just to be the best selves as, as they can can be, and yeah. I think it's it's male and female both have really got more comfortable with having a life coach. Where before people, I think, thought it was just to to one set of demographic, um, especially here in America. You know, as like people always think something is just for white people, and there's a big a big cultural issue with minorities, whether they're brown or black to have that issue with life coaching or even therapy, for, for instance, and they're not sure if it's meant for them. How, how can someone know that a life coach is, is meant for them? Or when, when does someone really determine that they need a life coach? All right. So here in the Middle East, the concept of life coaching is not as nurtured as it is in the, in the Middle East, in, the, in America, I mean. In America, the industry is actually very well grown. I mean, the industry itself is young. It's just been there for like maximum 30 years. So in the Middle East, we're still uh, raising awareness about what coaching is and that it's not advising, it's not guiding, it's not directing, it's none of that. It's helping you sit with yourself and get to know the answer on your own. Um, so um, from here, we someone would know that coaching is meant for them if number one, they are self-aware and they know exactly what coaching is. And the ones who think that, I mean, like sometimes I get people, can you please, um, can you please help me with, uh, with life coaching? I need someone to talk to. So no matter what their motive is behind life coaching for me to make sure that this is what's meant for them, I offer a free session. My first session is always for free and will always for free because I want them to see if this is what they really want or not. Is it helping them or not? That's amazing. And I think it should be free. I think um, a lot of people, you know, when they're starting anything out, you know, when they're offering a service, which so you are offering a service, someone has to taste it, has to see if it's right for them, like you said. And you also, sure, I think you're interviewing the client as well to see if, are they 
coachable or they're going out the right direction, right? And exactly. And if they're not, then you can say, well, I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm going to have to turn you down. And um, I think many people would take it a different route. Well, it's not, I would say some people, but they're just looking at the money aspect of it. And they'll coach people just to coach people and take anybody on. Um, true, but, true. But I think it needs to be a good fit for the, the coach and for the person who is being coached. Because it's, it's almost like a marriage. If you don't find the proper exactly. coach, what are you really going to get out of it? Right. So what kind of questions, yeah. what kind of things are you looking for? Like if someone is coachable, like what do you see that says, no, yeah, this is the person I want to match up with. All right. So number one, we want to see if we can both work together or not. Is he comfortable with me as a coach or was he uncomfortable or not? Uh, number two, for me, I really don't care if I like the client or not, because that's not the idea of it. The idea is to empower the person, even if you don't like them. And I don't know them to like them or to dislike them. So for me, knowing if they're uncoachable or not, there is a set of um, things that us coaches cannot coach, uncoachable, such as uh, certain personality disorders, such as phobias, um, such as traumas. For example, if someone is suffering from a severe, severe heartbreak, I can't coach them to get over this heartbreak. I can coach you to love yourself. I can coach you to help yourself to achieve your goals. But to specifically get over the heartbreak, no, you would need a healer or a counselor or a therapist. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah. So my pride as a coach should not stop me from telling them that I'm very sorry. I really wish I can help you, but I cannot help you on this. You know? Yeah, then that, that's honest. That's honest feedback right there. And that's what people really yeah. need at that point. So how is exactly. how is it in, in Kuwait, you know, you're saying, you know, definitely trying to bring awareness to life coaching. Mm -hmm. Are people receptive to it? Do they, are they confused by it? Is this something just like, hey, they don't, don't get or they are catching on? Uh, well, see, the, when I first became a life coach, everyone was like, oh, everyone is becoming a life coach. A lot of people are becoming life coaches in, in the Middle East with no certification or with no accreditation. But when I went for life coaching, I went for an approved certificate by ICF. I'm still going for, for the associate certified uh, coach certificate because I need to be credible, you know? Right. So a lot of people come to um, life coaching thinking that I will be giving my opinion on the issues that they're suffering from or dealing with. But that's 100% not true. I will not be giving my opinion and I will not be telling you what to do. So, um, and I have to raise this awareness in the first uh, part of the session. So one time I got someone who's like, all right, so you're not guiding me. You're not directing me. You're not telling me what to do. What are we doing exactly? <laughs> I'm like, well, well, we'll see together what we're doing exactly. But I promise that you have the answer within. And he was one of the best people that I ever got to coach, ever. That's amazing. He was one of the most coachable people that I got to coach. And I was very proud of him with the amazing results and actions that he created. Do you feel is either gender specific to where maybe someone is, one gender is more uh, uh, willing to have a life coach than the other? Mm. I would say most of my clients or most of the people who come for life coaching to based on like my my work most of the ones who approach me are i would say 60 percent females 40 percent males okay you know but it, it's i would say it's a coincidence you're right yeah i, no, I think but I, that's, I think that's pretty close that's almost, that's almost 50 50 yeah you know that's that's pretty that's pretty darn close and i think when people who don't see this podcast i think they they probably won't think of that you know, coming from out of the Middle East, I think there's so many so many varying questions or misunderstandings of what um, how people are, people do in Kuwait, and that's what attracted me to you too, as well as saying, hey, like this is, you know, this is a, a very you know prominent a uh, country that has things that's similar to America. You guys have malls. <laughs> you, you, you guys have, have women who drive and, and people like yourself, like women who can do things. And I think people, yeah. they see in the movies, is not the true 
um, array of color that's in Kuwait? No, you mean like whatever um, the the Western side of the world uh, presents to the correct. to their people about the East yes. or the Middle East? Yep. No, it's one hundred percent not correct. Like one thousand percent not correct. Uh, I remember there was a movie by who was it? I think oh, it was Indiana Jones. Okay. And they were. Um, I don't know what year was the movie shot in. Maybe seventies, eighties. I, I don't know. But they were filming something in a country that is supposed to be Egypt. And that was Egypt prehistory. <laughs> you know, like, I was like, no, that's not Egypt. That's not Egypt. And I love it when people come to Kuwait and they go like, wow, we just thought, we thought that you guys have camels here, no cars, nothing. But <laughs> uh, but actually, no, the, whatever, whatever is shown to... Um, to the West about the Middle East is 100% not correct. Um, we have a lot of men who respect women, such as my father. My father is a feminist before the words had been invented in first place. And, uh, and a metaphor, of course. Yeah, of course. And um, he tried his best to raise uh, me and my sister as uh, very independent, strong, powerful, empowering women. He tried to empower us in every single way. So I would say he's the greatest example to show to the West of someone who uh, advocates for women's rights. So no, whatever um, they show to the West is not true about Kuwait or the Middle East in general, because uh, innovation here is of a very high degree. Um, we have a lot of um, a lot of people who have a lot of passion for knowledge, for technology, and they're doing very well, men and women. So no, it's not true, unfortunately. Well, no, and I'm, I'm glad it is not true. I think, um, and that's yeah. what people need to hear. Those people need to really understand that, you know, these movies don't depict the people or the country in its, in its true true state. And it's, it's sad, exactly. you know, it really is. You know, I'm Puerto Rican and I'm from New York, but I live in Atlanta. And, um, you know, what they do to us in the island or what they've done to us in the island is, is totally different compared to what people get to see. The, yeah, real, the real truth. You know, everyone has their own version of something, but it's never the, the true version of it. You know, exactly. um, and it's, 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 it's a weird dynamic when you have people who are just misguided or ignorant. And like you, to your point, you said people come through and say, hey, I think you guys had camels. That's just freaking ignorant as hell. You know, you would think that people are going to go visit the country, they would do the research first. They would have an understanding of who they're visiting, um, exactly. where they're going, and understand the culture. I think that's the biggest thing about respecting having the culture. Um, but I think as, as Americans, we're so, so much in a bubble that we tend to just listen or, or accept whatever the first thing hits us, you know? Yeah. But um, I also want to say that um, the Middle Eastern culture is so beautiful. Like one of the things that the Middle Eastern cultures advocates for is marriage. And I think marriage is such a sacred thing. And of course, here having children out of marriage is, is like, whoa impossible it's totally unacceptable and i think that's very respectful for the rights of the children for the rights of the women marriage is such a great um way to protect women's rights and their children and uh, it just makes the whole process very respectful and very sacred i would say so there are a lot of stuff in my culture that i love and i'm very very proud of no it's amazing i think you're right i think when people look at women's rights, I think they have to look at the whole aspect of that. They have to look at culture. They have to look at where they're at and and, and compared to the world. Um, yeah. And also, what's acceptable as far as even religion based. You know, exactly. if, if you want, if you're going to follow those those type of things, then it's up to that woman or that group of women to decide. Hey, this is the rights that we we employ that we want to have or we allow. You know, like you exactly. Said, you're not going to allow yourself to to not be anything that you don't want to be um, or have exactly. that last 100%. You, you know? Um, yeah. And, you know, here in America, we have this Me Too movement happening for women, 
which is great, but it's almost like it's really what, what's the direction, what's the outcome of it, what's the end goal, you know, and that's the biggest thing. What is the end goal? What are we trying to get? You know, if it's just equal pay, okay, let's make mm-hmm. it about that. Is it is it truly about equal rights? Then what does it look like mm-hmm. compared mm-hmm. for men and women? And to your point, you know, we're having again a, a country that's going to represent you and talk about marriage and the sanctity of marriage as well and you know there's certain things that american needs to look at as well to see hey where can we learn from that's that's not within us you know Mm -hmm. this country is not perfect you know by any way and when we come down to it it's almost like america needs a life coach (laughs) 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 we need we actually need a therapist you know um, (laughs) It, it's changed, you know. It's not. It's not. It's not the the America people probably look at like from back in the nineteen fifties, you know. Um, and and to me, freedom is only you're only as free as your laws, you know. Exactly. You're only as free as your laws. So, you know, we talk about having freedom here, but again, it's, it's no different than any, than any other country. You know, you have to fall within these guidelines, within these rules, and you're only free within those rules, you know. And um, when I when I was looking at your IG page, it just again, if someone's ignorant to that side of the of the world, to the east, then they would get confused by your IG page. Why you're smiling? Why you're happy? Why you have makeup on? Right, and you're also yeah. a makeup artist as well. Yeah, that's um, true. It's one so, of my passions too. Exactly. You know, so you can have multiple passions. You can be a life coach and a makeup artist, and mm-hmm. while you doing makeup with someone you can life coach them through something as well get a twofer out of it mm-hmm. um you know have you ever been out of kuwait have you ever come to america of course yeah i had a i was uh, at a conference um last year last march the acro conference awesome now also yeah, for admissions and registrar's officers that's amazing now you've also taken up a toastmasters as well right that's true i'm a toastmasters member it's and whoever don't know what Toastmasters is, Toastmasters is as like this club, it's an international club, and a lot of times it happens within either the universities or uh, within businesses that they they sponsor uh, that club, and anyone could join, you know, and it, yeah. it really helps you with speech, with vernacular, um, yeah. putting things together True. with humorous stuff as well, you yeah. know, um, and. Um, it's I think it's a great thing. A lot of people don't know about it. It's been around for many, many years. And it does help you get to that next level. It does help you, even if you're yep. insecure and shy, right? Um, no matter how great of a public speaker you are, it still right. helps you. And the great thing is that here in Kuwait, we have 68 different Toastmasters clubs. And that's for a huge. small country, that's a lot. Exactly. That's huge. Yeah, that's huge. And that's yeah. a great thing. And that's, and, that's, and that's what people need to hear, understand, like, education is not just in the formal type of way. And I think Toastmasters really invites everyone to be open. And you have you know, and someone that's always that kind of watching in the background as well, and they, and they make sure, mm-hmm. um, you know, did you say this right? And someone's, you know, taking notes and, and saying, hey, exactly. no, you did this, that's fantastic. And it's constructive criticism. Right. It's not to pull you down or anything. It's constructive. And the good thing about, ha- like, joining Toastmasters or growing up in Kuwait in general is the amount of diversity that we have here. Like, if you live in Kuwait, you would literally meet every single nationality that you would think of. That's amazing. That's awesome. I think that's yeah. what people need to do. Like, people need to travel more. And we understand that this world is not as different as we think it is. You know? It, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. know, I have family that's uh, my, my, my cousin. He's married into my family, and he's, uh, he's Bangladeshi. And um, and my cousin conformed to be a Muslim. She's Puerto Rican. And um, and then back home in New York, you know, that's kind of normal, you know, as far as, you know, people intermingling and things like that. And we love my my little cousins, Anik and Aaliyah, you know, and the, the culture is so strong. And for when my cousin converted uh, to become Muslim, she, she, she did it wholeheartedly. She made sure that she was um, 100% with her husband in that exactly. phase. And his family accepted her like so well, um, and it wasn't it wasn't I think just just hey a great 
Bangladeshi wedding. She had a sari on. It was amazing. You know, um, the culture, the food. And, you know, she even said that when she gets, you know, her retirement age, she wants to go over and, 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 and retire in, in, in Bangladesh. And I was like, do it. You know, get out of New York. <laughs> get out of the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if people don't take the time out to to accept different cultures and understand what's going on, then you're just going to continue having this kind of repetition of hate going on back and exactly. forth. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You should always understand that you're anyone, anyone of any nationality, of any background, of any ethnicity. We should all believe that our our culture is not the most perfect culture in the world and that we should all learn from each other's cultures regardless of your ethnicity we should all have share we should all share this belief that your culture is not the best and um, we can all learn from each other's cultures like i mean we can learn great stuff from the american culture the american culture can learn a lot of stuff from um from the middle eastern culture so i sh- think we should all stop being judgmental and should have some sort of acceptance towards one another and towards other cultures as well. I think think, it will change a lot. No, I agree with you. I think it's also very generational as well, too. I think the new millennial group, um, right now the new millennial group in America holds the most passports compared to the last generation. Mm -hmm. Um, That younger generation is tending to travel a lot more and getting a better understanding of of the world, which I think is very well needed. Uh, back in the day, America was known for not having a lot of people travel outside the country, not having mm-hmm. a tremendous amount of passports at all, you know, unless it was for business. Um, no one really vacationed right. that way. And um, to see that, how it impacted that generation, I think that's where we are now because that generation wasn't willing to travel and to accept. True. True. You know? I I 100% agree. And likewise with our generation here as well in in the Middle East. I mean, I've definitely been to, I mean, see, for for myself, it was different because my father was one of the people who traveled a lot um, during his uh, years of youth. He traveled a lot. He worked a lot abroad. um, And he just tried his best to um, give us the best life through, um, like, putting us out in life, like putting us out there, like explore on your own. You've got your own wings and they work. And through time, you will get comfortable with using them. People from my father's generation are not the same. They're not like him. He's a very rare case. Right. Um, I mean, like if I would have a flat tire and call my father, he wouldn't come to save me. You know, and that happened when I was uh, when I was 18, when I first started driving, I had a flat tire. So I called him. I'm like, I got a flat tire. He's like, all right, perfect. Uh, I can come if you want. But what am I going to do that you cannot do? Right. You know, so he sent me a number to to get help for them to come fix my car. And uh, and that's how he raised me. And that's, that's how an he raised empowering me. moment. So, exactly. That, yeah. That, that shows you not to rely on someone else to rely on yourself. You know, yeah. that's fantastic. Well, to your point, though, you know, you had a very unique situation where he did travel. You know, he was exposed. and he, Yeah, he was very, very exposed. And he exposed us the same way and even more. Because we are a newer generation. We have more tools. We've got more equipment. There is now a lot more known places that we can explore. Um, women in, in my generation are definitely more empowered than the previous generation. So he's aware of that and he just increased this empowerment. How do you, how is it in Kuwait right now with the younger generation against the older generation? Um, is there anything that you would like to change that you feel like is a struggle for you there or is everything kind of, are you okay with things? All right. I love living in Kuwait. It's uh, it's my second home because I've been I've been living here all my life. Um, but I would say that I wouldn't change anything because I believe. I mean, like I wouldn't tell you that I would want to change the rules. I'm not going to tell you that I want to change glass ceiling or the fact that it's harder for women to climb up the corporate ladder. I'm not going to change any of that. I will just um, simply say that. 
If a woman is being suppressed or if she's suffering from glass ceiling, I am not going to blame anyone except the fact that she allowed herself to suffer from it because I suffered from glass ceiling and people tried to suppress me just because I'm a young woman and I simply did not allow this to take place at all. Um, I would change the way girls are being raised and boys are being raised. Okay. So I would, I would raise my son that a girl is as good as a boy and that right. they can both thrill in the society and both thrive. And I would raise my girl that uh, she shouldn't wait for people to give her her rights. She should have the power to take her rights and, and to ask for them if they're not being given the right way. You know? No, yeah, I think that, that makes absolute sense. And you have to. I think that's where the dynamic changes now to where, um, you know, raising your children to a point to where, hey, just being a good person, you know. Exactly. Just having that, that that standard of living and appreciation for your elders, which I don't think a lot of, especially in America, where we don't re- really respect our elders like we used to anymore. We don't take their wisdom into account anymore. Um, mm-hmm. We're so used to just kind of this going on to the next cycle. Um, respect kids being respectful or out of tone with with adults as it's almost been the, the exception now to to certain things like of mm-hmm. stuff or freedom of speech. And I'm like, well, if they're a child, there should be limitations. There should mm-hmm. be teachings. There should be um, corrections. You know, um, throughout that that child's growth. And if you don't have that, then what kind of adult are you allowing to come forth at that point? You exactly. Know, and that's that's what the world doesn't need anymore. You know, and I and right now in, in, in Georgia they had just passed um an abortion law. And um, you know, so that's that's the big news here in Georgia and around the around the states right now. And um they're not sure. An abortion law. Mm-hmm. Yep. So where right. um, a woman can't can't get an abortion after six weeks of pregnancy, mm-hmm. uh, if they mm-hmm. leave the state and try to get it out of state, then they will be um, held accountable and to be held as as pre- premeditated murder as well. Um, so right now they're allowed to have abortion in Georgia. Mm-hmm. Yes. Wow, that's big news. But now, but now they can't. Now the biggest thing now is that the the abortion after six weeks you can't, and if you oh, yeah, try to true. go yeah. out of state um, to try to get get it while you're still a resident of Georgia, Georgia is considered premeditated murder. And it's the same here as well. Yeah. We're allowed to have abortion, um, not in every single country, of course, um, right. but there's also a certain amount of time where the doctor can no longer carry out the the abortion. If, I think if it's six weeks or or so. Right. So that's that's what they passed. They passed in the in the House and the Senate, and um, now uh, people are trying to fight it, and and you know they disagree with that. Thinking that uh, they feel that women should have more rights, or um, they're concerned about you know. Uh, kind of what they call underground abortions, like illegal abortions mm-hmm. and things like that, that's going to come back and grow where, you know, women were dying on tables, you know, from getting, you know, going to the doctors who were just dirty and things like that. So it, exactly. It, exactly. it's, it's, it's a dynamic that people had to consider. Um, but it's also a dynamic that, you know, people had to understand so like, you know, what's, what is the right thing to do? I don't think anybody mm-hmm. really knows what is the right thing to do. It, it really comes down to, again, what you believe is right for you at that point. And to your point with the glass ceiling, you know, that's what it comes down to. You know, if if you're a type of person or, or people that want rights, you have to fight for that. You have to let people know exactly what you want. Um, I think the exactly. biggest issue that they have with this law is that because it was made by men and really had to have a lot of women involved in it, you know? True, um, true. And if you don't have that kind of side of the story and you have someone who doesn't have ovaries or uterus making a decision, it, it's kind of a weird thing to, you know for that you know um yeah so it's 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 a dynamic that we have to look at you know and um sure. again like i said each state here is different me when i lived in the north and i moved to the south it was a culture shock for me you know this this the, yeah. the, the racism and discrimination was huge you know 
Um, and everything here was like totally, totally backwards compared to living in the North or where I was at in New York. And, uh, you know, as people don't understand, as far as I was very cultured because I grew up in, in a city that had millions of different people, I was able to have the best street food ever, you know, be, you know, I was able to eat, have, you know, Middle Eastern food. I was able to have Chinese food and, and Russian, Ukrainian food and, and Greek and, um, Bulgarian food. I was able to have all that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in the South, you don't, it's very limited. It's just white mm -hmm. and black, you know? True. And again, like, you know, if you're not cultured enough, then your, your views of the world is really different and it's kind of scary. That's very true. <laughs> yeah. But it can, it can, um, make you i mean if you're not cultured enough if you're not into looking at other cultures that can turn you into a very closed person who's who has an extremely judgmental nature and uh, it can also give you a very negative nature as well because it can it does not nurture your openness to other forms of intellectuality other cultures um, which contributes to being very negative and very judgmental, which is, I think, what we suffer from mostly today. No, I think you're right. Um, do, do you feel like American um, culture has influenced Ku Kuwaitis at any given moment in time? Well, not just Kuwaitis. I, I would um, say the Middle East in general. See, the, the thing is, I always say Middle East because the Middle East shares um, a lot of similarities within their cultures. Right. And a lot of similarities within uh, the social rules and, and the norms and all that. So I would say that in general, yes, um, we are very influenced by the Americans as Egyptians and and, and sure. Lebanese and all, you know, just Middle Eastern in general. We are definitely influenced by the West. Uh, some people take it um, and improve their cultural aspects with it. And some people just take it into turning, what, what are they called? Um, the punk people when they first came out, what were they called? Do, Do you know the, 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 the punk style when it first came out? But the punk rockers? The punk rock yeah. music? Or okay. Yeah. I mean, not the music itself, but the way they act, the way they, right. there was a certain, there was a certain group of people who, who cut themselves and all that just to mix their blood. And that's how they became families. Yeah. Like the like blood brothers type of thing. And yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that we, that, that, that some young people learn too, which I definitely don't ag agree with. It goes against our culture, our religion, our norms, everything. But also, also we have taken the great stuff, some great stuff from the American culture, such as um, openness to other professions. Right. There are professions that we never knew existed and that we didn't really have a market for here in the Middle East. But the more we hear about it in America, the more we embrace it here. Like, for example, actuarial science. Actuarial science is one of the very popular majors in the U.S., but it was not as popular as... Um, as here in the Middle East. It wasn't as popular here. So my best friend decided that she wants to go study actuarial science because there's shortage of them across the world. Right. And it's a very well-known major in America. Life coaching, for example, life coaching started in America through the ICF, and that's how we have it here. It's still a baby industry here in the Middle East. But yes, I do agree that we are influenced by... Um, the American culture. Some people are negatively influenced, and like I told you, others are positively influenced. It really goes down to your awareness, because not everything in in the American culture would work for us. Like, for right. example, having children outside of marriage, that doesn't work for us because it goes. It doesn't go with our religion. Doesn't go with our norms, our culture, the way we've been raised. It just doesn't go with it. It's unacceptable to us. So we cannot take that and say that it's okay to do it just because it's in the American culture. So your self-awareness has to guide you to what is right for you based on your values, the way you've been raised, your culture, your norms, your religion, most importantly. And I think if you want to know what's right or wrong, you just go back to what the to what your religion says, regardless what your religion is. Yeah. I think again, again, with any religion, it's pretty much just, hey, just be nice to your neighbor. Just be a friendly person. Exactly. Just be a kind person. 100%. 100%. And that's transparent throughout the whole entire world. 
you True. know, and you find True. people like that all over the world. And just, I think the people who make the loudest noise are the ones, of course, want the attention. And they tend to get the attention because they make the loudest noise. And, and a lot of times the good people of the world don't get the, the full shine or, or, or the reporting or the journalism that they should be getting. So the world could know, hey, you know what? Most places aren't as messed up as the news reports. You know, True, 100%. Just like, just like in America, you know, we have horrible places here too. You know, Chicago is out of control. You know, they call it, yeah. Chi- they call it Chirac. <laughs> You know, which yeah. which which is like you know, that's not a good thing, you know. Um, but we tend to hide it. We tend not to to show it. We tend you know not to really put it out there, you know. But we need to. We need but, to put a face to uh-huh. it, you know. But see, when I went to to the U.S. last year, I I stayed in Florida for two weeks, and it was they were one of the best two weeks of my life. And I realized that because it's a very diverse place. People get to see different, I mean, like Americans in Florida get to see different cultures and get to see different nationalities because it's a touristic area at the end of the day. So they were very, um, they were very nice to, I mean, like my sister, they didn't really recognize her because my sister is, is blonde and she has very fair skin. She, she looks American, but I obviously don't. <laughs> <laughs> so actually I got most of the attention and it was great attention because they would come up to me and they would say, Oh, I really love your hijab. They wouldn't say head scarf. They would say hijab because they're now, because of their openness to other forms of intellectuality, they picked up the terminology and they're okay with accepting me walking down the, the, the street with them. They were very accepting. I didn't feel like there was any sort of racism or discrimination whatsoever. And um, Orlando has people from all over America yeah. come to Disney World, Universal Studios, whatever. And uh, and they were all very, I mean, like every single American that I have met there in Orlando, knowing that they come from different states, some come from New York, some come from whatever. They were all very nice and very accepting of who I am. My and I wore it in the same form. I didn't put the turban or whatever. I I just like it in this form. They were very accepting of it. They were very um, accepting of my skin color. So I think things have changed over the past few years, because nowadays they travel to the Middle East for vacation. They travel there for right. business. So they they're no longer in the bubble, just like they used to be. Right. No, you're absolutely you know, right. I think they have they have improved a lot. Which um, and like for for in September I'll be pursuing my master's in the, in the United Kingdom, and I'm not really worried about how people will treat me or racism or discrimination. I mean, if I do see any type of racism, uh, I don't care. I'll still deal with it. That's okay, because I am who I am, and I will never change. And I'm very proud of my background, and I take so much pride uh, in, in my culture and, and my religion and my identity and, and all that. So uh, I'm not worried about it because also I know that people have changed so much over the past years. No, you're absolutely right. I, I totally agree with that. I think, again, it comes down to people being open and willing to learn. Uh, yeah. People to, to take apart, understand someone's culture, like you said, instead of calling it a headscarf, calling it exactly what it is. You know, um, exactly. It's a respectful thing to do, you know. Well, right. now if you don't know either, you can always just ask the person. I know if someone asks me a question, just ask. I'm okay with that. If you don't know something, just be honest sure. with it, and I, I will have no problem explaining to you how things work, or how or how I am, or how the culture is different, you know. And and to your point, even outside, see, it's, it's funny because outside America, you know, people just look at everybody inside America as Americans, but in America, we're very fragmented. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people don't feel American. You know, even though yeah. I was born in Brooklyn, I'm I'm Puerto Rican, and I identify as being Puerto Rican before mm-hmm. American. Yeah. You know, and and it's it's like that. You know, so it's it's you know people you know, and also America has a stigma of putting a name in front of something. So no one's ever just American. You that Italian American or you Middle Eastern American, right? Oh, yeah. it could be African American. American American, like, and, and it makes no sense. You, you you're already fragmenting it from day one, you know. But exactly. it, like, in the, like in the UK, no matter who's there, they're just Brits. Exactly. Very true. Very true. And that's it, you know. Yeah. And I'm hoping one day we can get to that here, 
um, can only people that get to call themselves Americans are the white people. And that's yeah. it. And they're not even from the actual area. <laughs> Right. Exactly. <laughs> Some of them are actually not from the actual area, but it's just based on the skin color. True. Right. Very true. Because they conquered it, right? So, um, I mean, if my sister gets the American passport, she would be called just American because she definitely looks like one. Right. Exactly. You know, and that's the yeah, thing. But I too. wouldn't, although we're sisters. No, and and yeah, well, and that's the biggest thing. I could say the the culture aspect of things, and like I guess right now the big the big thing here is is brown and black people on the rise and really showing people yeah. that, you know, we are smart. We can, we can be doctors and lawyers and um, mm-hmm. we can be life coaches and, 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 and do the things that, that white people can do is we you know it's Definitely. not that different. We're just people overall, you know, mm-hmm. and we have a long way to go. You know, we're, we're still a very young country, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're still a very young country that's, that's on, that's been living here like in, in, in this concept of the, the democracy and capitalism. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And I think we don't do a good enough job as calling ourselves out when something doesn't work. You know, um, not so long ago, that past week, <clears throat> there was another school shooting. You know, it, it's, it's happening more and more frequently. It's just become the normal true. thing. And yeah our leaders haven't done anything to really prevent it or stop it or come up with something. But the weird thing is that it's really happening in like kind of like what they call middle America. It is not happening in the major cities. It's happening in the rural and the suburb parts. Growing up in New York, I grew up in a very bad neighborhood in Brooklyn. And there was a lot of, you know, guns and violence there. But in the schools, a couple of fights here and there, but it was never a shooting. And even to this day, New York City has not had a shooting. With 9 million people, you'd think that'll probably be the first place. And now they have, you know, metal detectors and stuff like that. It's almost like the airport. You have to put your bag through a, uh, through a scanner as well before you get into the building. But mm-hmm. that's part of the culture of living with 9 million people in a small town, you know? Yeah. Um, and it, it comes down to, really, like I said before, like, you know, really understanding the culture from every different state here is different. You know, of course, you have your t- traditional, you know, strip malls and malls and stuff like that. But every culture is different in every state. And even though we try to blend it to one nation, I think we tend to forget that, that every state is really different and how we need to kind of do things uh, differently for those people in that state. I live with the court in the Bible Belt. So it's very, it's very Christian. It's very heavily religious. Um, just, but they they're supposed to have separation of church and state. Is really kind of blended as well, mm-hmm. um, so it's 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 different coming from New York City to to the South in Atlanta, and like I said, living in the Bible Belt, um, and you, and you see how the, the religious people have never really taken charge of the area, and um, they infiltrated the polit- politicians as well. So, I'm not sure if we have people who represent in our office everyone at this point. I think mm-hmm. it's really fragmented as well. People are just confused and don't know how to represent people at all. And while you're, while you're in Kuwait and you say you want to take your master's in the UK, why the UK? Why not, why not someplace else or why not, why not in Kuwait? Um, all right, because um, in Kuwait, most of the programs are a master's in business administration. Okay. And that's not what I want to do. I want to do international business because uh, although I'm a life coach, I think it's absolutely okay to be a multiple disciplinary thinker. And uh, I strongly believe that I really want the experience of living alone because I strongly believe that it will definitely reveal a lot of things that I didn't know about myself. Right. So, um, and I'm a very adventurous person. I'm a 100% risk taker. So I'm very excited to get to know myself all over again. You know, when you meet someone, you're very excited to get to meet that person. Yeah. But we, we often forget that yourself is the most important person that you will ever meet. So I am very excited to get to know myself on a different level. I am very excited to see myself grow in different ways. I mean, like, my confidence always helps me um, transform any place into a comfort zone because I get familiar quickly with the atmosphere and surrounding and all that. 
but I really want to see how I will perform when I go to a completely new area without a single family member, without a single friend. I'm really excited to see how I would perform and I'm excited to surprise myself. No, I think that's fantastic. I think that's, that's a challenge that everyone should have for themselves. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's, if, if you don't do that, that's what I did. I, I left New York when I was 24 to come to Atlanta and that was, mm-hmm. that was hard. That was difficult to move to, you know, across the country. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you move to a brand new country as well. That's, 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 that's enormous. And like you said, not having family, not knowing folks. I'm sure, they, and you're, you're super friendly. So I think, you. You, I think you're going to be just fine. You know, and you have this energy about you that's amazing. It's really drawing. You know, like you have this aura about you. Um, yeah, thank you very so much. So I think you're going to really, you know, gravitate. People are going to gravitate to you. That's going to be the right folks because um, you have high standards. And that's, that's the best thing you have, you have to have is once you have high standards, then you're going to attract the right people around you. Exactly. Right. Never, ever settle for less than what you deserve. And don't give your time to, um, to anyone who does not fit within your standards. I'm not saying be judgmental, but I'm right. saying that when you give your time to, to someone, you're giving them a portion of your life that will never, ever comes back. So you have to make sure that this time had been invested in the best form, not wasted, and that it was given to the right people. doesn't mean that we're all going to fall into the trap of giving it to the wrong people, of course, and that's how you learn. Yeah, absolutely. And you said something right now about, you know, about giving your time to some people that you know that you're never going to get it back. Do you feel the last generation before us really wasn't in tune with that? That there was so much about being workaholics and just, you know, oh, yeah. trying to survive oh, yeah. that they didn't know how to live? 100%, which affected how they raised their children, which affected how they understood themselves, which affected their purpose of life. I mean, like if you ask someone who's a workaholic, who just works to survive, I mean, what's your purpose? Yeah. They, you would actually take them by surprise by asking that question and they would try not to answer it because answering this question at the age of 55 or 60 or 65, after spending your whole life just working to survive with no purpose is very painful. It's heart shattering. It's, it's heart bombing. Yeah. When you finally realize that your your life had just gone past your eyes and you haven't done any of the things that you really wanted to do, you spent most of your time at work to survive with the people that you love, but you haven't actually spent any time with the people that you love and the people that matter the most. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think nowadays uh, people are more aware of that time. I know I am myself. Uh, yeah. I had to switch my careers and that's why I'm doing podcasts now. Um, cause I want to talk to interesting people around the world. I want to talk to strong people. Um, I want to talk to people who have a passion, um, that can teach me as well. I'm always loved. I love to learn. And, amazing. um, amazing. And in my career, I was a workaholic and I missed out on a lot, you know, cause I thought that was the way, you know, that's what you're taught. You're taught to, at least here in America, you're taught to like, you know, get a job, stay there for 30 years, retire, get a pension. You never exactly. talk about. It's, you never talk. You never, never talk about vacation. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There's no vacation. There's no hey, like you know, take time off. And if you take time off in America, you kind of look like you're weak. If you call off sick, oh my God, if you're sick, why'd you call out? <laughs> well, I'm sick. <laughs> you know, Obviously. And, right, you know, and, and I'm using a sick leave that the law is giving me the right to use. <laughs> exactly, and it's and it's frowned upon. It's like, oh my God, you called out sick. What's wrong with you? And and that's a culture that that's a that's a and that's a cultural thing again that I think men made up because uh, it was just heavily male dominated you know, from the from the sixties seventies into eighties where a lot of women you know still weren't prominent in the workplace yet so that male ego of being you know that kind of, kind of pounding in the chest you know I'm I'm stronger than you type of thing um, I think has really is is really dissipating here now and then when we call our baby boomers here um, the older generation. They don't understand a new generation coming up. They don't. They don't get how they think. They really don't understand again the movement that they're trying to have. Mm-hmm. And um, most people now don't stay at a job for maybe two or three years. Very similar to yourself. Like True. you said, hey, no, my, I was. I felt like it was over. And that's something happened exactly. to me as well. Like after after two or three years, I'm like, where's my new challenge? Like there's nothing more I can do here that's going to challenge me. Exactly. And you that's can gonna- just no longer see the future 
yeah while you're still doing the same thing i mean like it does i tried to visualize the future and i i i couldn't i just could not i'm like okay then it, it's over here right now at this moment and i went against everyone because no one wanted me to quit my job specifically my parents because they they just wanted me to to stay you know um and my friends my my best friends everyone but um i insisted to follow my passion um even when i wanted to go for life coaching i was thinking today that while i was um in the process of the payment my mom was like are you sure this is what you want i don't think you know um um you should really she was basically doubting the the idea and i was like no this is what i want to do you know and she was doubting it because she didn't really have the right background about what life coaching is and i'm grateful that i i rebelled at certain times and did and just followed my passion and you had to take a chance on yourself you had to take a risk exactly because it's it's my life you know exactly. so i have to follow my passion because when i am I have to follow my passion not my fear because when I'm 90 years of age I want to look back at my life and see that it reflects my passion not my fear not anyone's passion not anyone's fear not even my fear I want it to reflect my passion I don't want to go with I wish if I did that you know I want to do it all right now when I have the time the power the energy everything No I agree with you and I think that's where a lot of people are headed now a lot of people are really taking that risk factor understanding hey that no, life is short. You know, we don't have a lot of time. Very, here. exactly. So many yeah. ideas, so many intentions to change the world, but very little time. Yeah, and it's about how can you contribute or just contribute to yourself or your family. You know, my biggest contribution to me is making sure I'm the best person possible, so that I can present that to my family. You know, 100%. If, if I'm if I'm if I'm tired and and beaten and dragged out. Then how am I my best self for my family? How how is my family expected to be the best of, of what they can be? Um, exactly. And again, that was that was something I had to learn. I wasn't taught that. You know, I was just taught to just work, come home, work some more, get some more sleep, then go back to work. Yeah. And um, I did that for a while, and it, it really destroyed, you know, uh, my youth as far as my twenties into my thirties. Because all I did was just work, work, work until I realized, no, I can't do this. I'm burnt out. And when you're burnt out, that's the worst feeling ever you can have. You know? Actually, one of the one of the things that made me look even look forward even more than I was already are was when you told me that um, it was Mother's Day yesterday and you wanted to spend that with your uh, with your wife and your children. And yeah. I was I was very happy to to read that. Because it says a lot about you as a person. It says that you appreciate time so much. You're into the precious moments. You're into the moments that take your your breath away. You're into making um, moments count. So uh, I, I was very happy to to see that you are actually into the idea of doing sentimental stuff. No, absolutely. I, I adore my wife. She's an amazing queen. Um, she is my queen. And um, I treat her as such. And um, it made the most sense. It's like, no, I can't. I'm sorry. It was my fault, too, because I didn't update my calendar. You know, but um, as soon as I recognized what day it was, I was like, I'm sorry. I have to reschedule. Um, I was very happy to reschedule. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thank you for understanding. And and I, and I knew, too, listen, there, there may have been a chance that, you know what, I could have lost you. And you could have said, you know what, I'm sorry. That's the only time I can do it. I can't go do it any further. Um but for me, that was a chance of taking. I was like, hey, that's not a problem. And if I lose the interview, then you know what? I, I'll do better scheduling next time. Um, but I'm going to make if sure. You lose the, if you lose the interview, then It wasn't maybe, meant to be. It, it wasn't meant to be. And maybe it wasn't the right person. Because if a person does not appreciate such a thing and will not um, help you by compromising to reschedule something else that could be for next week, that's absolutely fine i mean like there's always a slot that we can that we can absolutely. put in an interview and no one is busy like one if you really want something you'll just make the time for it and i was more than happy to make the time for it today because yesterday obviously meant a lot for you and i was very happy that you got to spend it with your wife and family yeah. and i'm very happy to see the way you talk about your wife um she's definitely very lucky to have you you're also very lucky to have her so that's very pleasant to the eye and to the ear it's very pleasant no, absolutely. Like, you know, she's, she's, um, man, I, I served her hand and foot yesterday. 
um, mm-hmm. make sure she did it, nothing at all. And she felt weird because <laughs> no, she, <laughs> she's the anchor to it, to our ship. You know, she does, 100%. She, you know, she does everything for us. And um, mm-hmm. she's just an amazing, amazing woman, a very strong woman, very smart woman. And for my kids to be around that, the dynamic and we don't argue we don't we don't fight we have our disagreements of course we have like you know uh, debates would never i never call her out of out of her name or out of turn um and she doesn't do the same for me and our kids kind of laugh at us because you know, they tell us we argue like fifth graders and um <laughs> <laughs> so um, they have a blast with us because at the end of the day after five minutes we're over it and then we're just gonna we just start debating about anything and um, exactly. and we have fun with it. The biggest thing is having fun and having, like you said, these moments and memories of life. And I think, I think that's what people have to understand too: is life is short, but you just can't be busy to be busy. And 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 exactly. some people tend to do that. They tend to be busy to just to be busy. Um, yeah. And it's a that, status. I'm busy. Yeah, it really I'm is. It, for some reason, as people have, yeah, they just made that a thing. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, and my whole thing, if you're not getting a result out of it, if you're not being more profound or you're not being more enlightened, then I don't want to be busy to be busy. You know? Well, see, people want to be enlightened. Uh, sorry, people want to be defined most of the time. They yeah. like to always have a definition, whether by marrying someone uh, of a certain status or a certain definition to help them define themselves. Like I'm married to that person. I am Mrs. Whatever. Right. Um, and uh, a lot of them just think, I think because it's one of the um, attributes of important or one of the um, facts about important people is that they're always busy. So everyone goes like, no, sorry, I'm busy. No, sorry, I'm busy. No, sorry, I'm busy. And I think that important people do make time for important stuff. Or stuff Absolutely. of value, or stuff of strong purpose. Absolutely. So, yeah. I think it's it's all about you just making sure that you qualify your time for the people that you want around you and the type of work you want to do, and that's it. You know, and to your point, like you know, making time. I had to learn how to do that, control my time, and then and not let time control me. And um, once you do that, it's a great thing we have that control because then you can really decide who you want to really spend quality time with. Like I said, we get well, yesterday, I wasn't on a computer, wasn't on my cell phone. It was all about sharing that moment, just having fun, watching whatever TV show or any movie she wanted to watch, no matter how painful it was. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it. And um, cook dinner. Yeah, watching a, watching a movie that you don't like is, oh, is for man. someone is is a big thing. That's that's called. I know love. how it feels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. True. It's, it's a pain, that point, that's painful love. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but it's a blast when you do that for someone. And when and, and, and we just said to you, you can't define yourself by having someone else be that definition for yourself. That because yeah. at that very point that you're not really you don't know who you are. You know, like you said earlier, you know, you go into the UK because you, you can't wait to meet who you really are. You can't wait to meet the new version very or the excited. future version of you. Yeah, you know? very, very excited for, for how this experience is going to shape me, for the moments that I'm going to have to push myself out of my comfort zone to learn more about myself, to get to see more of what life has to offer for me, yeah. to do a lot of character building. N- nothing about networking. It's literally... I'm excited about networking with myself. That's yeah. the thing that I'm mostly excited about. Um, I mean, like, uh, um, one of my posts, I was speaking about marriage and why some people get married for different reasons. And some people are very excited to be defined by other people because they don't have their own self-definition. Right. Some people want to get married for emotional stability. Some people want to get married for financial stability. Some are afraid of the idea of being alone or growing old on your own or or dying alone. And um, every time someone, exactly, out of convenience, 100%. And every time anyone asks me, why aren't you married until now? The answer is because I haven't found the person that um, I would share passionate love with. You know, I mean, I'm not excited to, to feel loved 
because I already feel loved. I love myself very much. My family loves me very much. The right people love me very much. I have a very healthy circle around me. So unless it's a purpose that serves me 100%, the same way I would serve it 100%, then I don't have time for it. And um, it's not the right thing for me. Likewise with traveling, there has to be a purpose behind you traveling. And my purpose is really definitely self-development. I want to get my PhD as well because I want to become a university professor and it resonates with my purpose, which is changing the world one person at a time. So I want to do that with my students. Um, a lot of those college um, students need a lot of help and I hope I can be, I, I'm thriving to be that help for them. So there has to be a purpose behind the traveling and mine is really excited to meet myself. Yeah. That's so that's so amazing. You're just amazing. I think you're fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very very much. No, um, and I think that's what and that's what people need to hear. Especially you, know, you you're going to become an educator. You know, future students need someone like yourself, with that lens, with that vision that you have, and to share that because um, a lot of educators don't take on that type of 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 style of of, of teaching you know, of giving awareness, you know, um, sometimes they're stuck in their own way. Sometimes, you know, educators haven't found themselves and that, and to them it's just a job. You know, I think yeah. if you're going to be an educator, it can't be a job to you. Like, like to your point, helping one person at a time. You said that so many times in our conversation so far. Um, that's huge. That's really big. That's, that's meaningful. You know, because that's what you can do. I think, you know, if people say they want to change the world. Well, I know for a fact, I only could do it one person at a time. You know, exactly. until, you, until you grow your audience, until you grow your following. And then you see that one person at a time does add up. And then, exactly. And in hopes they would go ahead and, and resonate with somebody else as well, wherever the teachings that you give them. And that's the biggest thing, you know. Well, you're truly amazing, Lena. Wow. Thank you very much, Johnny. Thank you. I thank you very much for your time. And thank you for, for the initiative. I thank you for your purpose because you really don't have to do any of this. You don't really have to interview someone with, um, like someone else would go for someone who has a hundred thousand followers or 800,000 followers or a million and a half <laughs> of <laughs> followers. And, and there are a lot, they do exist. You know, they do exist. And the podcast, that's why I call it Johnny Nomad Presents. And it's called a podcast for the people because um, it's not my podcast. It belongs to you. You know, it belongs to people like yourselves who are, who are unique, um, who are genuine, and who is making changes and making the kind of ripples in the, in the water, making a little bit of a noise for themselves and for others. Um, and those are the people I want to talk to. You know, it, and I don't care if you had zero followers. It's, it's, if I find you interesting, that's what that matters to me. It's having that conversation with an interesting person that where someone else can listen to this podcast or, or watch it. And they get to see what you look like, who you are, and be amazed and say, wow, okay, people are just people, no matter what. And that's, that's, my, that's my goal. That's my goal of the podcast is really to have this interesting people where other people can learn from. You know, I had a gentleman a couple episodes ago. He was incarcerated. He was in jail for about nine years. And he wound up becoming an entrepreneur when he came out of jail. He reformed his life. You know, it's, it's stories like that that people need to hear, I think. Because I think as well, when, when you, people tend to, to follow other people, they already see the pinnacle of their result. They already see how this person's on their summit. Mm -hmm. but you don't really get to see or notice their growth. You know, mm -hmm. you don't get to, to follow them through their growth or their mm -hmm. struggle. And that's why I talk to people who are just starting out their journey or in the process of their journey. And now people can actually now follow you through your journey and see how far you're going to go with it, you know, and, and kind of be right there with you and as motivation, mm -hmm. as inspiration. Um, I think that's what people really need. Cause at the end of the day, like for me, I've learned more from people who are just like yourself than from watching the famous people who, who already made it. I can't connect with them. I'm not making $3 million. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I don't, I'm not driving a Ferrari. I cannot connect with you right now. You know, but I can't connect with someone who drives their own car or takes a bus. You know, oh. um, I, I know that story. You know, um, 
but why is that person now driving compared to taking the bus? That's the next step, you know? And I think people want to have goals like yourself. And even though you haven't mentioned it, but you did, it's by that next step, you know, having that, that, exactly. that awareness to the, to the big goal, but what is those steps to get to the goal and enjoying the journey and the process the, the, you have to love the process. You have to, um, you have to enjoy your journey. If you don't enjoy your journey, then what do you end it for? You know, cause that's where you're going to learn everything. Cause once you get to the goal, it's over. You know, once you get yeah. your master's, you're done, but you're really looking forward more to finding yourself. The master's Definitely. is going to be there. That's your, that's, that's your way to get to the UK, but it's really all about you at the end of the day, exactly. you know, which is amazing. I think you're going to be just fine though. You know, I think, Thank I think you you're brilliant. Much. I think you're going to be just fine. Um, Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. No, absolutely. Uh, I just want to add that uh, one of my uh, professors, I would say mentors in life, because the funny thing is I never got a single class. I never took a single class with him, but I got to learn a lot of life lessons from him. Um, he just did the exact same that you do right now. He makes everyone feel that they're very important. And by, by talking to them and by telling them, come and talk to me whenever you have some free time, he mentors them, he coaches them. He just, he does exactly what you do. He gives his time to the people that he thinks are valuable and, um, can actually be something. And at that point they could be nothing or they could be really struggling but um, just like you, he, he, he gives them their time with complete happiness. And um, he always pushes them to shoot for the moon. Because mm -hmm. worst case scenario, they're going to land on one of the stars. So I always tell him that I will land on the moon one day. Because um, you really have to believe in yourself. And that's why I thank you very much for coming across my profile, for taking the time to actually contact me, to, to invest your time uh, in this. And... You have a great purpose out there. You literally give everyone a great sense of importance because I looked at your your profile and some of the people that you've interviewed, I've never heard of them, but now I do get to know them through the great thing that you are doing, which is empowering people by, recognize, by recognizing them, by giving them a great sense of recognition and achievement because... I'm sure that you don't want to give your time to someone who you think is not there yet, but you think that they're all there at one point, and that's why you're giving them your time, and that's a great thing for you to do. I mean, like you're 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 just doing it for for nothing, and that's a great purpose. No one would want to have a. I've never seen a podcast like that. I've never come across <laughs> that. Everyone wants to interview the people with thousands and millions of followers, and they are a lot. Yeah. And um, I just can't thank you enough. This is very purposeful of you. This is that's very kind. It's very generous. You're literally one of the people who I can say are changing the world one person at a time from from your spot right now. Wow. That that's very empowering and very inspiring. And I wish that a lot of people would want to highlight the good in our world the way you are doing. Um, I wish that a lot of people would be just like you and would want to empower others and make them feel very important and give them that great sense of achievement. You're you're just great. You're amazing. You're you're literally one of a kind. I've never met someone who wants to do this <laughs> just like that. Thank you so much, Inda. That that's I'm I'm humbled. I really am. Um that's amazing. I'm pretty you got me speechless now. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's really the least we can say for someone who does things with such great love and passion. And you kept following up with me. Emails were sent on time. Um, when I told you about that program on spot, you went and you did your research and you just want the best outcome for everything. So that's <laughs> amazing. Amazing. No, I, I want to make sure that everyone's comfortable. Again, like I said, this is not my podcast. It belongs to the people. And any given time, I can upgrade it with technology. And I can, this is my home. You see in the background. We're gonna change this. Where I'm right, where sitting right now is my dining room. We converted into a little office area. Now it's gonna convert into a studio. Mm -hmm. um, where I'm gonna start having in-person interviews. Um, hopefully amazing. by this summer. And so um, the, that's that's the main goal. To start doing more in-person um, videos, which would be more like a documentary style. The way I want to have is black I'm and sure white. you'll get there. I'm sure yeah. you'll get there, and you will thrive at whatever you do because of your amazing, amazing passion. No, I, I appreciate it, and it's it's it does come passion. I get paid zero dollars. It's all about the fun, 
It's all about the engagement of talking to someone, having a conversation, learning, and, and someone willing to, to share. That's the biggest thing too, right? Because we, can, we can't have this conversation if we're both not willing to share and be open and vulnerable. And you have to be vulnerable in life to, uh, to succeed. Um, exactly. and, uh, and as to your point, yeah, it's about getting that next person I interviewed to find out about the last person I interviewed. You know, um, and as I grow myself as well, and my followers, my goal is to make sure I stay with that premise of, you know, yeah, if, 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 if I have the opportunity one day to interview a famous person, my only dynamic would be, are you willing to be honest? I don't have time for you just to be famous. I need exactly. you to be open and honest Amazing. about what's going on in your life. Not to go dig Amazing. deep and be nosy, but I need to know exactly, like, you know, how do you operate? How are you, mm-hmm. are you okay type of thing, you know, in your soul? Because um, fame could damage you, right? True. And um, my goal is to make sure I stay humble. My wife keeps me humble. She makes sure <laughs> she puts me <laughs> in my place. <laughs> my kids do the same thing as well, which is fantastic. <laughs> and um, but it's a, it's a blast. I think having fun, like you know, just us sharing a laughter like this, and we are literally across the world from each other. Um, but I have learned so much, you know, from you. And this is not going to stop. You know, I, I keep likewise in, here. I keep in touch with all my guests. I follow up Definitely. with all my guests. Um, and if I see them doing something, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the biggest cheerleader, the biggest fan and biggest promoter. Um, mm-hmm. and I, and I continue to do that. You know, it's going to get more difficult as I, as I interview more and more people, but my, you know, my goal is to always at least once a month hit somebody up and say, Hey, how you doing? What's going on? I, I saw your post. It sounds fantastic. Or are you okay? I saw your post. you know? Um, so this is not the last conversation we're going to have. I really want to talk Definitely. to you when you get to the UK. And you're there for definitely, a few weeks. Definitely. And definitely, I just want to see definitely. how that transition is and, and how I'm you, so excited as well. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm excited for that's why I'm gonna to talk to you again and, and really see like, you know, how you're handling it. And then letting people know like it's it's okay to put yourself in a predicament that you can control. Yes. You know, and that the outcome is gonna be fantastic because you're choosing for it to be that way. Um yeah. I think it is just be fine, man. I think it'd be great. Um your, your, the way you're, you're, you're really kind of coding your future is, uh, is, is, is amazing. I think a lot of people can learn that from that. And women, and that's my biggest thing, too, is trying to find strong, empowering women that can interview. You know, I have, I have uh, four daughters. And nice. Beautiful. It's, 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 it's huge for me to make sure that they get to have engagement with strong, powerful women you know, like the mother, like people like yourself, Mm -hmm. um, and see that what they can do, that they're not just kind of quarantined from doing anything that they want, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And like you said before, having that glass ceiling, you know, it can be there. It doesn't mean it's for you, though. Exactly. I I rebelled against it, and uh, I raised, and I did everything that they said were hiring a guy to do, and I did all that and much more, and I eventually raised the standards for whoever is coming next. So right. whoever is coming next, whether it's a man or a woman, uh, it was a man, um, they're going to have to work towards those standards that I set as a woman. That's right. I love that. That's some, that's some badass shit right there. That's good. <laughs> 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 that exists as well. That exists as well. But the outcome becomes the best when you truly understand that the only person that you can control is yourself and yeah. that things are going to go on according to the way that you choose to, to react to it. But yeah, when I have to be a badass, I will be a badass as well. That exists too. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to be. You have to be. And, and, and you are because you know, the way you challenge yourself, the way you're taking risks, the, the way you're making your moves. Lena is a badass. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I am a badass. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Man, this is awesome. I don't want to hold you up any longer. This conversation has been fantastic. It's thank amazing, for... empowering. Thank you very much, Johnny, for everything. Thank no, you. Thank, thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to you. No, abso- absolutely. Um, like I said, we're going to keep in touch. I'll definitely, definitely. be texting you. And um, as soon as you go out to the UK, we got to follow up with that and get Definitely. you back on. 
definitely definitely thank you very much donnie and thank please send so my best regards to your beautiful wife and to your oh, beautiful children i will thank you so much we'll talk soon thank you very all much right. make your day a great day all right you too bye-bye bye-bye